And to my left is uh, Brian Persley. Uh, he's been in ministry for 15 years. Um, he's been a student pastor, a teaching pastor, and a lead pastor. Um, he's married to his best friend, Brooklyn, who's over here. Wave, Brooklyn. <laughs> and they have two adorable, but sometimes crazy, um, <laughs> kids, right? Right? Um, those that have been here either for the dessert on Friday night or yesterday for the picnic know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they are kids. Um, just a couple interesting facts. Uh, Brian did receive his Master of Divinity and Master of Arts in Religion from Liberty University and his Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Studies from, Cedar, from Cedarville University. And then just wanted something a little bit out there, you know, like in your personal life, what's something that people wouldn't know about you? And two of the things I found out were, number one, he's on a mission to visit all 30 major league baseball stadiums. <laughs> And, and he, he described his musical taste of that of your average soccer mom. I didn't go any further than that. I didn't ask what that meant. But, um, Brian, we're really glad to have you with us. Um, and I'm going to pray for you, and then we're just going to um, let you kind of share your passion. Father, we thank you for Brian and his family for this weekend. And I pray that you will, in a supernatural way, speak through him speak your word, and just challenge each one of us. May you anoint him in a special way. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. It was $127, and I found myself in a bind because I'd set a budget for a grand. And if I went with the extra $127, it was going to push us over. You see, we needed two new appliances. We just bought a new refrigerator and a new dishwasher. And the $127 for installation was just going to push us over that threshold that I had set. And so I decided, you know what? I got this. And so I went to a place where you can find out how to do anything in the world, YouTube. And there was a seven-minute installation video on installing a brand new dishwasher. And my chest puffed up a little bit. My lungs filled with air, and I got a smile, and I proudly marched into the kitchen and proclaimed to my wife, Brooklyn, baby, I got this. She looked at me and said, you got what? And I said, I got this. I'm going to install the new dishwasher. And she looked at me and said, please don't. And I said, I got it covered. It's okay. It's a seven-minute YouTube video. How hard can it be? So the Lowe's delivery truck came, and they brought in the refrigerator, and they put the refrigerator in place where the old ones stood. And then they brought in the dishwasher, and they looked over their paperwork, and they said, oh, you're installing it yourself. And I said, yeah. And I said, sign right here. And they smiled, and I signed right there, and they left. And then my wife left to go to a bridal shower. And so it was I, along with our two boys, Ethan and Dean, who were five and three. And I said, you guys, go take a nap. <laughs> Daddy's got a little project to do that'll be done by the time your nap is over. They went and took a nap. Two and a half hours later, my wife returned home from the bridal shower. I still had not yet discovered which breaker to turn off to <laughs> unplug the old dishwasher. And so I did what was only natural and only safe. I killed the power to the whole house. <laughs> it was 95 degrees this day that I killed the power to the whole house. The air conditioning quit running. And then I went and turned off the water. And I said, I got this, baby. There's nothing to fear. And then I realized I didn't have the first tool in the seven-minute video, the one to make sure that the power lines were, in fact, off and I wasn't going to electrocute myself. So after cutting the power, I then made a 20-minute trip to the hardware store, got the circuit tester, came back, ran the circuit tester, and discovered we were great. And so I took off the kick panel of the old dishwasher, and I began to take off the old water connection to the old dishwasher, only to discover that it was stuck. And so I, I went and I grabbed some tools. I don't know the name of them, but I have them in my toolbox. <laughs> And I grabbed them, something that locks so you can get a lot of torque because 
I'm ripped, but I'm not that ripped. And so I locked the tool on the, on the water disconnect and cranked it for all it was worth, and I maybe moved it a hair and just started grunting and groaning to the point Brooklyn thought I was dying, and she had smartly gone upstairs, and so she ran downstairs to check on my physical well-being and discovered that I was indeed still alive, so she wasn't able to cash in on the life insurance policy quite yet. And so she went back upstairs, and then there was more grunting and groaning, which quickly became a theme of the afternoon. And then it happened. I got the water connection loose. I said, yes! And just as I said yes, I discovered a drip. That's all right. It's a water connector. You just got to be some old water in those lines. And so I still had the tool tightened, and I just torqued it for all it was worth. And that's when I discovered that the water that I'd turned off was only the cold water and not the hot water. But luckily, I'd killed the power. So as soon as I missed the first spray of the hot water, it wasn't going to scald me anymore. It was just like taking a warm shower in a 90-degree house. Who doesn't want to sign up for that? That's great. Well, then I discovered I'm just going to reverse this process, tighten it back up, and we'll call somebody, have them come over and help. And I don't know what happened. But when I did that, Water poured out like we were visiting Niagara Falls, and it didn't stop. I'm like, baby, come here. And she comes downstairs and looks at me and says, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. And when these things happen, I get mad, and Brooke gets sad. And so I'm like punching the countertop, and Brooke is crying. And I don't mean like a couple tears in the eyes. I mean like ugly crying. Like it is, it is not a good day for anybody at this point. And I'm like, go turn off the water supply to the house. And she said, where's that? And I said, babe, we've only owned the house for five years. I don't know where that is. And I'm just pulling out every, we went through every towel that we owned as a family. I'm talking every bath towel, every towel that wives have out that you're never allowed to use. They're decorative towels, right? You're not, don't you dare dry your hands on them. They are just to be seen, not to be used. They're as stupid as throw pillows, all right? They serve no purpose. Don't you dare use them. Whatever you do, don't use them. I used those towels. I used rags. I used old t-shirts. She finally found it. We finally got the water turned off. We had to call in an emergency plumber, $275. Later, we got a new water line, still didn't have a dishwasher installed. And the next day on Monday, I was at Lowe's paying $127 to have somebody come install the new dishwasher that was still in a box sitting in my kitchen because I was out of my league. I didn't stand a chance. You ever been there? It might be a home improvement project, it might be a job, it might be a relationship, it might be the lack of a relationship that you desperately want, but you find yourself in a situation where you are absolutely hopeless. You don't know what to do. This morning, we're going to see a story that a guy named Matthew records for us, and Matthew was a follower of Jesus. But he's also an author, and he gets to tell us one of the four major stories of the life of Jesus. And he takes us behind the scenes in a really cool part of what Jesus is doing in his ministry here in this world. And so if you have your Bible apps or your Bibles, you can follow along with us in Matthew 9. We're going to look at Matthew 9, beginning in verse 35. If you don't, it's on the screens on either side as we get to see the heart of Jesus And he takes us behind the curtain. And we start this morning there when we read this. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, just earlier in Matthew 9 alone, just in one chapter alone, this is the journey that we see that Jesus has gone on. Jesus, he went and he discovered a a paralyzed man and he healed him. And then Jesus upsets the religious people in town. He upsets the religious people because the religious people look at who Jesus is hanging out with. And they're not religious people. 
In fact, the people that Jesus are hanging out with would be the people that your parents warned you about as a kid. All right? They'd be like, don't, you don't want to hang out with them. And those are Jesus' friends. And so the religious people see this, and they're like, what, what, what is Jesus doing? They ask his other friends that. They say, what, why does Jesus hang out with these people? What's he doing? And Jesus just utterly rebukes them, and he says, listen, I didn't come for the healthy. That's not why I'm here. I didn't come for the healthy. I came to engage those who are sick. I came to engage those who need a Savior. And then things just, just elevate even more than that. Jesus encounters a girl who has died, and he brings her back to life. He heals a woman who had a, who had a bleeding disorder for 12 years. And just an encounter with Jesus, he heals her. He gives sight to not one, but two blind men. And Jesus casts out demons of a demon-possessed man. And this is the hottest ticket in town. People are clamoring to get close to Jesus because everywhere he goes, things are happening. I mean, you think Packers tickets are tough to get, all right? If, if Jesus was selling tickets to these things, if he just wasn't doing free events, scalpers could retire on one event alone because people were clamoring to get close to Jesus. And in the midst of all of that, his friend Matthew pulls back the curtain for us and he shows us the heart of Jesus when he writes this. When he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so what we see is just this litany of incredible things that Jesus has done, but we see the heart behind Jesus and what compels him to do all these things, what compels him to shut up the people who don't understand what he's all about. And the heart behind that when he sees people is immediate response is one of compassion. And my question to you, Lakeside, is what is your heart? When you live in a world that doesn't make sense, when you live in a world that's full of chaos, when you encounter people who don't agree with you, whether it be spiritually or politically or just the way that you conduct your life, what is your response? Because if there was anybody who could condemn it was Jesus. And yet, as Jesus encounters people, the heartbeat of Jesus is one of compassion. He sees the brokenness. He sees the helplessness. He sees the confusion. He sees the destruction of their choices, and he moves beyond all that, and he sees the person behind the circumstance. And when you see the person behind the circumstance, you can't help but be filled with compassion. And we live in a world where everybody wants to scream out the other, and everybody wants to debate every single thing. And we've lost sight in many regards of the people behind positions. And as followers of Jesus, we need to make sure that we always keep at the forefront the people and not their position. He's filled with compassion, and he's harassed because they're harassed and helpless. He sees their harassment. He sees how helpless they are, and he likens them to sheep without a shepherd. And so as we're excited about the future, as we're processing what the next step is for our story and what the next step is potentially for Lakeside's story. One of the things that we saw that, that even led us here today, one of, the, one of the values that you have that brought us to this point, Lakeside, your value is that you are concerned about the people who aren't here. You are concerned about the people who, who live lives full of helplessness, who live lives full of harassment, who do not have the hope that you possess. And the heartbeat of Lakeside that we have encountered, that we read about, and now we've gotten to experience through so many conversations, is to see those without hope discover hope. And the only antidote to the helplessness and the harassment that people have and experience is a relationship with Jesus. Sheep without a shepherd is a perfect descriptor of our world. We see it on display. 
There's no lack of, of experience that any of us have seeing this. May we always keep people at the forefront and not their position. And then Jesus, he's not only full of compassion, but then he turns to his disciples. And he says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, this was primarily an agrarian society. A lot of people made their living by farming. And so Jesus uses an example that everybody understands. He looks at them and he says, the harvest is plentiful. Everywhere you look, there's work to be done. Everywhere you go, there's work to be done with your neighbors, with your coworkers, with your families, with the people that you encounter when you go to dinner. Everywhere you look, if you have the right mindset, there is work to be done. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. So everywhere you look, there's work to be done. But, every, but there's not enough workers to meet the need, he says. And then he finishes by saying this. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So don't just bemoan the fact that there aren't enough workers. Don't just bemoan the fact that this is, is where you find yourself. But do something about it. And he says, first do this, pray. Pray. Why in the world would Jesus say pray? Why wouldn't he say roll up your sleeves and get to work? Well, one is because so much of this falls in the spiritual realm and we can't do this in and of ourselves, but also because of this. That when we pray for God to do something, when we pray for those that we see who desperately need a relationship with Jesus, when our heart breaks, when we see people and not their positions, and we desperately call on God to do something about that, when we do that, this is what we find. We will discover that we are the answer oftentimes to that prayer. That we need to go. And we need to get busy. And we need to work. And this is what's so incredible, that God uses us, broken, flawed, incomplete, hurt individuals to accomplish his purpose, to accomplish his work for his glory. Not because he needs us, but because he chooses to utilize us in the thing that he is most passionate about. There is no greater honor. And so we get to, we get to, be used by God. And I know sometimes it gets hard because we're, we're broken and we're flawed people and we get tired and there's a lot of commands on our time and there's a lot of, lot of demands that people have of us and a lot of things that people want from us and all those things can suck us dry. But may it never get to the point when we have an opportunity to be invested in somebody's life, when we have an opportunity to use the passions and the gifts and the skills that God has given us, may it never be to a point that we get so tired and so burnt out and so frustrated that we lose sight of why we do it, that we lose sight of the people and we merely see their positions. May it never get to the point where we start to think, I have to do this. No. We have the privilege of getting to serve our God. So I want to tell you, if I'm offered this position, if I'm offered the opportunity to lead Lakeside, this is what we will do. We will provide compelling non-threatening environments for people regardless of where they are in their spiritual journeys. We will provide compelling non-threatening environments for people regardless of where they are in their spiritual journeys. Whether they're somebody who's followed Jesus for 50 years or whether they've never heard the name of Jesus before, when they walk in these doors, they will know that they are welcome here and they are loved and they are valued as individuals. Our approach is to make church not threatening. And so what that's going to look like is everything in our culture is going to be with the mindset of those who do not yet follow Jesus needs to be comfortable for them. Our environments will be warm and they will be inviting. They will be comfortable for people who otherwise would never feel comfortable in a church. We will communicate things in a way that makes sense to people who do not have a lot of time within the church culture. 
You will not have to, you will not have to learn all the church lingo in order to understand the things that we are going to communicate. We're going to be intentional about the language that we use. We're going to be intentional about what we choose to get involved with. There are a lot of great things, but a church can't do everything. And so we are going to be intentional about what we choose to get involved with in our approach. Reaching our community of Algoma and Kiwani and Luxembourg and Sturgeon Bay and across the board. Our approach is your lives and your stories. To leverage your influence, to leverage your relationships, to leverage the people that you know, to leverage what breaks your heart. And to highlight the stories of what God has done in your life. The change that you've experienced and the change that you've seen. There is work to be done. And it's time for us to get to work. There is opportunity. And it starts with us making sure that we collectively and corporately see people and not positions. And we provide them the answer. And they find themselves in a helpless, and harass state. And so if we're honored to come and lead Lakeside, this will be a church that points people to Jesus. And we will leverage everything we have to reach just one more. Just one more. Just one more. We hope you'll join us on that journey. God, I pray that you would help us see people in the way that you do. God, I pray that you'd help us be energized by the idea that we get to work alongside you. And Lord, we get tired and, and we can get burnt out. And so God, just help us keep that at the forefront of our minds. And God, I pray even right now that you would just tug on our hearts. The name of a neighbor or a coworker or somebody that we encounter frequently. It needs you. God, I pray that you would just open up an opportunity for us just to point them one step closer to you. And God, that you would give us the boldness and the grace and the intentionality to follow through. Thanks for using us. And God, I pray that you do incredible things in this community, through this place, for your glory. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.